Um, tonight I want to talk to you guys about two things, um, two concepts basically, or programming techniques. Um, so in, in order to demonstrate these two techniques, well at least for the first technique, I needed to pick a programming language that had certain properties about it. Um, one of those properties it needed was something called monad comprehensions. Um, there are three languages I can think of that had that. Um, there is C Sharp, it's Microsoft C Sharp. Um, there's Scala and there is Haskell. And there's a few other ones, but probably not suitable. But I've actually chosen Scala and I've put the other two in an appendix in these, this document here. So we can switch to whatever language is most appropriate. But the, the thing that, uh, that I think is going to help us to, to best understand these concepts is your understanding. So first of all, I don't know what you guys know. So I'd like to know who knows what a monad is. Yeah, you and I have talked about this at the pub, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I know how much you know. <laughs> um, okay, and who has heard of the reader monad? Who uses the reader monad? Even on Saturday nights while everyone's out partying. Right. Okay, fine. Okay, so the reader monad basically is a specific instance of the monad of a monad, and um, I'm going to talk to you about that. Um, I'm also going to talk about the writer monad. And these two monads solve two different problems. And so I'm actually going to try and appeal to problems that you've probably encountered in your typical programming day um, and tell you how these, how these solve it. Okay, so... Um, oh, I've done that. So, um, so basically, well, in, in the time I've been programming anyway, usually when, when it comes to things like a application configuration, I usually see one of two things happen. One is that someone has a great big global one set variable and they plonk it somewhere and it's called the configuration and every function in the application accesses this thing. It's right once. So it gets set before the whole application reads it and then the application starts reading it. And if you upset that while that application's running, bang! All right, you've surely seen this. Or, or no, no, what really happens is the product manager comes along and goes, our customers want to be able to change the configuration. And the programmer comes along and goes, la di da di da and then bang! I've seen that a lot of time. Inversion of control, some, you know, there's all sorts of little euphemisms for this buck. Okay, so um, that's one form of gymnastics that I've seen. Um, yeah, sorry, that's one, one form. Um, yeah, when we, when we need to adjust the configuration, when our, when our product manager comes along and says we need, the, we need it to change. Um, so what happens next, I've seen this too. What happens next is people go, you know what? I'm not going to have a global once set variable. I'm going to just pass it to every single function that needs it. Have you tried this? <laughs> you know, like conf, conf, you know, you've seen it, right? You know what I'm talking about? All right, so the reader monad is to, is to alleviate this problem. Okay, so basically it allows you to treat values as if they were just values, except they are computed with a configuration. So, like, you know, we can think about you need to compute some value, except you need the configuration to compute that value. Right? But what you want to do is just treat that as a value and have that configuration bit handled automatically. And that's what I'm going to, that's what the reader monad is specifically designed to solve. Not just for application configuration, just for anything that computes a value. Okay? So I'm going to draw on your ability to know what a monad is, or at least half of you who put your hand up. So um, this is this is hypothetical now. Imagine we've got this great big application configuration setting. So again, it's Scala. We've got a host name, that's the string, the port, that's an int, and we've got some out file that we need to print swizzle to. I don't care. All right. That's our configuration. It's three values. And uh, in, so in the, you know, the pass-it-around-everywhere model, we would have an instance of this that gets passed around everywhere. And uh, that's how things would go. Um, and by the way, it's called the reader monad because in order to compute this value A here on the right, we read the configuration. So you'll notice here that I'm not modelling the ability to write to the configuration. So when, you, when your product manager comes along, this is unsuitable. You need to swap this out for one that can write to it, which I'm not going to talk to you about. I just don't have time. <laughs> um, if you saw the next slides, you would have seen reader writer state. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about reader writer. State is the one that would allow you to modify it as you go along. We can talk about that at the pub later if you like, that's fine. Um, 
So I, I hope you I hope you guys understand skull annotation. Who doesn't, by the way? That, that's pretty straightforward. It, it will get a little bit hairy, but that's okay. Face configuration returns an A. It's just an interface, right? Um, what's next? So basically we need a couple of useful functions. One is a function that takes an A to B, a config reader A, and returns a config reader B. So basically that means that if we've got something that takes a configuration and produces a value A, and we can get from A to B, we can also get something that takes a configuration to return a B. This function is going to be useful. You're probably wondering why. Trust me for now. And this one's that says config reader B over there, by the way. This one's very similar, except this argument's different. So basically, in, in, uh, in the function that goes from A, it's actually got access to the configuration before it gets to the B. That function will come in handy as well. Who recognises these two functions? Who knows what a monad is? <laughs> okay. Oh, all right. So basically the next thing I'd like to do is have a look at some code. It'll be 20 lines, okay, so brace. Here we go. <coughs> so again, this is Scala. So we've seen this bit up here. This is that abstract method that we had. And now we've got these two methods here that satisfy that signature that I just showed you. Okay, so if we have a look at this map function, map, so map is a method, right? So it's like the first, the config reader A is, is this, you know, is in the object, sort of this. Um, and then, then it's a function A to B and it returns a config reader B. So what it does is it instantiates that interface, takes in the configuration, C, Wax it into into this thing's apply method, right? And it gets back an A, yeah. And then it calls F on that and gets back a B and returns it. So that's straightforward Scala. And then flat map um, does almost the same thing, except once it calls F on the A, it gets back a config reader B, not a B. And once it's got the config reader B, it just passes the configuration again in there. Okay. Um, who uses C sharp, by the way? Who knows the select and select many methods? All right, so that's what these are, right? Except, so you, you know when you're using link syntax, you go from select in. In Scala, if you call these a special name, you also get similar syntax, right? They're just not select and select many, they're map and flat map. All right, so that's why I've called them that. If you don't know what I just said, because you don't know C sharp, don't worry. <coughs> so, um, Swizzles. <laughs> so suppose we have an arg. So I've basically got this use case. I gave this talk the other day at work, and uh, I came up with this use case, and it turned out that I needed to go another 30 minutes, right? And I just don't have the time for that tonight. So I'm hoping this use case is going to get the point across at least enough for us to spend half an hour at the pub talking about the rest, or, you know, whatever it might be. Suppose we have this function that accepts these three arguments: swizzle, swizzle, and things. It could be. It's just a straightforward function, right? Nothing to do with configuration at the moment. And it needs to return a spickle. Here's the signature, straightforward, right? So in Scala syntax, um, it takes a swiggle, swizzle things and returns a spickle, right? So do we know that this arrow here is right associative? So there's two parentheses here and here. Yeah? So it's in, in what some people call this curry form. So once we pass in a swiggle, we get back a function that we can pass a swizzle, a things, and then spickle. It's not really important at the moment anyway. For, this, for these purposes. It could be just takes three arguments and returns a value. Um, however, in order to get to a squiggle, for whatever reason, we need the configuration. This can happen in our application code, right? In order to display hello to the user, we need to know their name to say hello Bob, right? It's in the configuration back there. So, um, they need access to, but we want to avoid the clumsiness of passing it into all of them. Let's pass it in, and if they need to, they need to pass it on to compute their value. They pass it on. Got this great big tree of comps, right? What's all that about? Crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. So we need to get from there to there, right? I'll just, uh, well, maybe I won't scroll down. But anyway, we need to get from here to here. So, but, and uh, like I said, I need to work on my CSS. That signature there is the same as that, except config reader is on the outside of each one. Um, so if you're with me so far, 
that a squiggle needs its conf configuration to be computed. In other words, configuration to squiggle, configuration to swizzle, configuration to things. We'll get back a configuration to spickle that we can just pass in a configuration and the whole thing just pumps all the way through and does all the computation and then bang, it's done. We got back a spickle. We passed the configuration once. Right? Let's do that. Who, who recognises this function from the people who know what monad means, by the way? No? Two. All right. Cool. It would have been bad if everyone put their hand up, right? I'm just to preaching to the choir here. <laughs> <coughs> so I'm just going to sort of clarify this, uh, this, this problem a little bit more in terms of passing this configuration around. We essentially want a three-argument function that is lifted into a config reader. That is, we've got a function that goes from some A to some B to some C to some D, squiggles and whatever. And we want to get back something that is lifted. Will that fit? No. Please imagine what that says. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe some of these ones. Is that OK? Maybe a bit small now. But we need to take A, B, to C, to D and get back config reader, A, etc. to B, to C, to D. That's what we want. That is the essence of our problem. Because once we do, we can start, we can trick squiggles and swizzles and things as if, the, as if they're not accessing the configuration, then pass it into whatever this function is, and then pass the config configuration itself in, in the result, the config reader D or config reader spickle, and then we've got a spickle. So we pass the configuration once. That's the essence of our problem. Let's write that. More code, ready? Brace. Here we go. All right, so we probably have to spend a little bit of time on this function here. So basically, um, this, this method here I called uh, lift3 con config reader, and it takes this function a to b to c to d, and it returns the function that goes config reader a to b to c to d. And what we do is we call the map, uh, well first of all, we name the, these, these three here are named, a, b, and c, and on a we call the flat map method, right? So remember that method back there? We call flat map. You want me to write the, the type up here again? Yeah? So flat map, or basically there was a config reader of A, and then it had this flat map method that went A to config reader B and then it returned config reader B. Right, and then there was also this map method that went A to B, and it returned config reader B. So these are the two methods that we're about to use. So they're like instance methods on the object. Right, so on the A, we call flat map. What we now have to pass in is a function from A to config reader B. So these A's and B's, by the way, are different to these A's and B's. I wish I'd have written X and Y now. <laughs> <laughs> This usually tricks people. I really will write it. Let's do it. So, um, is, is there a type checker out there for me, please? Uh, boss? Yep. Thanks. <coughs> right. So, we call flat map on our config reader A. We now have to pass in a function from A to config reader Y. And here, here is this function right here. This is of type A. The AA is of type A. And then what we do is we call flat map on B. And we now have to pass in a function from B to config reader Y. Because this whole thing has to be a config reader Y. Let's not forget that. This whole thing here has to be a config reader, well actually config reader D, this D here, in order to get back to the config reader D. Which means that this thing here, from there to there, has to go from B to config reader D. And then we call map on C, and now we have to pass in a function from C to D. Well now that we've got an A and a B, and a C, it's pretty damn easy to get a D. 
which is called f. Yeah? Is that, do I have any questions at this point? That's really important stuff for the people who didn't put their hand up when I asked what is a monad. This is, this is, this is monadic computation that you're looking at. Okay? So, it turns out that Scala, well, three languages, have a special syntax that makes this really easy. So I'm going to show you some more code in a minute. I'm pretty sure it's when I hit next. All right, and what's going to happen is this is going to switch a rule around here. This A is going to go to the left. The A is going to go to the right. <coughs> and there's going to be arrows and there's going to be no calls to flat maps or maps. So on the next one, there we go. This is exactly the same function. So from here up is, is no change. It's this bit that just changed. So we called A, B and C again. They're our configurator A, B and C. And instead of going A flat map and then given A, A, we say we'll pull A, A off A. This is a configurator A. This is A. We comp so these two here are keywords, or and yield. This will get compiled exactly to the code that I just showed you. And that's called a monad comprehension. And that, that's what C Sharp has, and Haskell, and Scala. Still no questions at this point. I can never tell if people are confused or they're just like, yeah, no worries. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> okay? What this means, though, what, I mean, what this really means is that we are actually using values A's and B's and C's and calling F on them without ever looking at the configuration, ever. So our, our code, if we just imagine our code that will have access to the configuration, there will be no for and yield. This will be equals, right? We'll go val A equals, or val AA equals A, and whack the conf in. We'll go val B, B equals B, and whack the conf in. C, whack the conf in, then we'll go, and then val D equals F, A, A, B, B, C, C, whack the conf in. So we've passed it four times. Where here we haven't passed it at all yet. Not yet. I mean, maybe you want to take this value and keep using it in even more monad comprehensions or whatever. It's when you get to the final computation, we go, actually, I'm ready to go now. Here's the configuration compute. You need, only need to pass it once. That is the point of the reader monad. OK? Like I said, I can never tell. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I've said this a couple of times, right? So here's how it looks in C Sharp. Um, using link syntax. Um, and then the reason I wanted to point this out is that while, while maybe you are a bit bedazzled at the moment, there is a really popular programming language that has this stuff in it. Okay, so I think that's cool, right? I think that's great. Um, and, and you'll hear different people <laughs> call it different things. I just call it what it actually is. I don't see the point in pissing around at all. Some people do. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, that's what the reader monad is, one specific instance of the monad and what problem it solves in this case, which I hope I've appealed to, uh, to a problem that you've encountered in your everyday programming, because I sure have. I've seen it a lot. OK, any questions at this point? Because we're going to go into section two. I've got a question. Um, sure. You, with that lift thing, you, you had a function that uh, didn't have any config stuff there, right? Just A, B, C. Yep. D. And so it's just a regular function. It could be int. It didn't yeah. read any config or anything. So no. What was the point of the lift, lifting it? Because that, that function we had didn't read any config to start with. That's, that's the only thing that's. So the config reader A, config reader B, and config reader C, they will have read. So they're values that are still yet to be passed in, right? Yeah. They will have read the configuration. So let, let's just call A an int. Right, and we'll call that we'll call that I don't know the age, right? We don't know the age because it's on the configuration. There's a, there's an age field in the configuration, so all it does is just call age on the configuration and return it. But what that means is in our fork comprehension, in our monad comprehension, there that a that's coming off is of type int, so we can just treat it as an int. We don't have to explicitly pass in the configuration to get the int, so that we can operate with it. We're just delaying that execution of passing in the configuration. We just keep building and building up until we're ready to actually pass it in. Does that help answer that question? No. No? <laughs> I think 
it's the, the lift lets you, you've got a function that knows nothing about configuration. It takes A, B, C, gives you a D. Yeah. The lift turns it into a function that can take values that need configuration yeah. and produce a final value that also needs that configuration. Yeah, so it can be a function that, need, that, that reads the config. And that's what you're saying, right? Yeah. But I think that's yeah. what I needed. Yeah, so yeah. this thing here, this thing not here. A pure, well, no, it's not a pure value, but it's a function value. Well, yeah, it's just that's abstracting away the conflict complete, so it, it makes it irrelevant. So it, it, who cares where that comes from? Yeah, it's just enabling you to to, to um, yeah, lift out the result of that and deal with it as if it were a pure thing, yeah. just by virtue of the fact that it's being wrapped. So like I call it like a generic wrapper, but I am too shy. But uh, yeah, that's how I sort of think of it. It's just yeah. wrapping up how you're going to get to that, and then being able to lift that out and effectively rewrite the function so that. They're completely agnostic to all of those effects. It's, well, that's my understanding. Uh, so, the question sure. on the slide before this one, I just want to look at the. Yeah. So, our configuration is really coming out of the flat map and map. Configuration uh, or values? Uh, where is flat map? Flat map produces a config reader of Y. Yep. So, we're really pulling. So, that's that in there. The config reader A out of the, the call to flat map. The yeah, flat map. we're pulling the A out. So that, that's a type A. Yeah. Yeah. And then once we, so I mean that, that that's clearly the case, right? Because if if we have a config reader A and we call flat map, this must be of type A. I mean, yeah. It, it just has to. This thing here has to be a config reader of something. We we're not saying this doesn't say what. It just can be anything. In this case, it's config reader D. Does that answer that question? Yeah. Yes. Cool. Maybe we should go and have a beer, man. Well, I, I think the other, the other, the other interesting thing is then that the config um, might have something of type A, B, C, and C in in it. Mm -hmm. And if it's got two things of the same type, just is there a problem? Yeah. Yeah, that's a general problem. Right, then you would that's that's a problem that's called the Turing holding problem, right? Because it would be nice type. if types only had one inhabitant. Right. So you would create a type age rather than using an inhabitant. Oh right, yeah. So that that's yeah. So that's a bit more. Let's concede to this Alan guy. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm I'm off on a little bit of a tangent from where right. you're going. Sorry about that. That's alright. Um, it could be the case, yeah. Right. I mean, a, a good example, right? So suppose. Suppose a person, right? Not a person might have an age, a name, and a whatever gender, right? So we could write a function that just that, that all it does is looks at names and ages and names and genders and produces some value from that. Yeah. And we and we can just lift it and then pass the configuration in yeah. one day. Maybe maybe straight away. Maybe not. We don't have to. We're in the reader monad. We can do whenever we want. As long as we don't have a silly function that goes um, first name, string, last name, string, age, int, something, something we do. Well, then I mean, we have that, to refactor first and get some more type information. Maybe, yeah. So, but that's a general problem. That's a general programming problem, right? So there are actually some languages where that's not possible. This isn't one of them. Okay. Yeah. I mean, let's imagine I said I'm thinking of a string and there's only one possible string it could be. Could you tell me what it is? I mean, no. But imagine I said, well, its type is this. It's got a length of 10, starts with A, and you know, B, C, D. Now you can start to tell me what string I'm thinking of. Yeah. Right? So we can, we can get like, right down with our types to do this at some point. To do it for the general program is the equivalent to solving the holding problem, sadly. It would be nice if that didn't exist, right? We wouldn't be using these <laughs> languages. I think you're just talking about a general problem, though. Yeah, I think so. I just. Yeah, I needed to know that in order to work out how this problem was a general solution. Okay. Yeah. All right, so um, I'll just sort of, you can have it, I'll just sort of give you a quick squeeze. This is what it looks like in Haskell, right? I'll just scroll down for you, right? So there's a configuration, there's our config reader, there's our map, um, Haskell calls it fmap, there's our flat map, Haskell calls it greater than, greater than equals. Um, there's other three, and there's there's do you know, so do is a keyword in Haskell, right? And and here we are using a monad comprehension. Sorry, mate, let me just lift this up. <laughs> okay. 
Um, there's a, uh, yeah, that's Haskell's monad comprehension syntax there. That D should be slightly different way to the Scala, doesn't it? It does. It does indeed, slightly differently, due to what's called the monad functor law, right? So fmap will actually never be called. I could actually delete that there and it will still compile. Um, and for you C sharp guys, this is how it looks. Um, um, there's our configuration. Um, I've had to, I was using Mono when I wrote this, and there's a bug if I use put select and select many as methods. Um, so I had to use extension methods. Um, and then, well, let's not go into that really. This is what it looks like. There's, yeah. there's the Mono comprehension there. That compiles and runs. Tony, do you have any, do you have um, some code that shows the call site? No. Right. Well, yes. I just didn't push it to my repository last night. Um, and that's actually the extra half an hour bit. Um, so, like I said, I spent a fair bit of time with some guys actually calling this lift method with persons and ints and ages and whatever else. Um, and it seemed to sink in for them. We can do that another time, though. That's cool. Um, will you push that to your repository for us? Yeah, when I get home, I will. Thank you. No worries. <laughs> um, so, now. This is going to get a little bit more involved than the one we just talked about, so I hope you're all prime now. Um, this solves a different problem, this particular monad. This one's called the writer monad. Um, 